Welcome back to Cincinnati Zoo Tales. I'm Jenna. And I'm Mark. Thank you all for tuning in for yet another episode. We're really excited today, Jenna. We're talking about rhinos, and specifically Sumatran rhinos. We just had some really exciting news regarding Sumatran rhinos that we're excited to talk about today. But before we get into that, we're being joined by two guests today. We've got a, a full, pe- full house. We're being joined by uh, Dr. Terry Rolfe who is our director of CREW, the Center for Conservation and Research of Endangered Wildlife we have here at the zoo. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Roth. And we're also being joined by Paul Reinhardt. Paul's one of the keepers at our children's zoo right now, but back in the day when we had Sumatran rhinos at our zoo, Paul was the head keeper of Wildlife Canyon, uh, where the rhinos stayed. So thank you both for taking the time to join us. We appreciate you coming out. Thanks for having us. Good to be here again. Yes, again, and more rhino talk, but specifically, like we mentioned, the Sumatran rhinos. You two are our resident experts on Sumatran rhinos, and I feel like you've had incredible experiences with them and have done so much for this, would you say, the most endangered large mammal on Earth? It's certainly a contender. (laughs) Certainly a contender for that title. So one of the rarest large mammals left in the world. Um, So they're a very special species, and I feel like they just have a really incredible tie here to the Cincinnati Zoo. So we want to hear all about that, um, the experiences you have both had, and we mentioned there was some good news recently. Um, But we'll start off, we've talked with Dr. Roth before. Will you just remind everybody who you are, a little bit of your background, and then we'll have Paul tell us about how he became a zookeeper here. Oh, sure thing. So, um, yeah, I've been happily working at Crew here for about 27 years now. So really the bulk of my career has been right here at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. Um, but prior to that, um, I did work out at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. shortly after receiving my Ph.D. degree. Um, I have always had a passion for working with wildlife species. So when I was young, I grew up in California, went to the San Diego Zoo a lot, fell in love with wildlife, and um, just wanted a career path that would, would get me pretty much right where I am today. So it's been, it's been really wonderful, um, and it's been a great time here at Cincinnati, and the rhinos have played a big role in that. So. Um. I feel like it's incredible that you kind of knew this is where you wanted to be, because I didn't even know jobs that... like what you do exists and you figure that out, you know, years and years ago. I think that's pretty cool. So Yeah, it was it was it was interesting. I remember when I graduated from college, my my dad said something to me like, Nobody decides what they want to do when they're really young and just sticks with it. But I just stayed on that path and um, it's paid off for me. So it's been a lot of fun. Good. That's great to hear. Mm-hmm. What about you, Paul? How did you get to the Cincinnati Zoo and how did you get to be where you are today? Uh going all the way back. I knew I wanted to be around animals, I guess. Um, my mother brought me here to the zoo when I was probably just in high school, and I happened to see a sign that talked about the zoo school here. It was called Natural Resources Management, and I uh, applied to go. They accepted me, and for the first time, I think, in my young life, I, I, I felt like I was at home. Mm-hmm. I really felt really comfortable here and uh, had good experiences. Uh, worked my whole senior year just about in the African Belt, and then uh, a job came open not long after I graduated in 1981, and I've been here for a little more than 40 years. That's incredible. Wait, so it wasn't always called Zoo Academy? No. I didn't know that. Natural Resources Management. People before me were like Mike Land and Tom Tenenfeld and some others have come and gone. I actually took Tom's job when he left the zoo the first time and then they hired me and then Tom came back about three or four years later. Man, what what department did you say your first job was in? I know you said you worked in the belt and then... African Velt and uh, uh, the Deer Line. Okay. It was a, where it was all one department. It was called the Deer Line, uh, Bactrian Camel, Llama, uh, Alpacas, Rhea we had down there, uh, Bison that were a lot, a lot of fun, intimidating. You had to go in with everything, and yeah. that's kind of what what made my life back then is because I like being in with animals. I like Mm -hmm. touching them. I like uh, 
taking care of them. Yeah, and the interactions and the all interactions. of that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Jenna had mentioned you guys have obviously both had some incredible experience with rhinos. Paul, did you know that you wanted to take care of rhinos, or did that just kind of happen organically as your career moved on? That happened just working in the vet because you guys may or may not know there was a pair of black rhino in the vet, Ralph and Princess, and started working <laughs> with them. They were very prolific. We had a lot of calves born down there, and then. When Princess left, Julie came in. That's about right when Dr. Roth started, or at least started working with us at the Velt, and uh, it just happened. And I've always thought black rhino are always going to be my favorite. But when uh, Ipu and Emmy and Rapunzel were all here, and I was utilized more in that area, uh, it was not hard to just fall in love with them, want to, want to be there every day taking care of them and see how they, how they grow and uh, what we could learn from them, I guess. They are like truly one of the coolest animals ever and I'm guessing most people don't even know what a Sumatran rhino is. So will you guys describe them, describe where they come from and you know how they look because they are unique it, when, much, it, when you compare yeah. them to other rhinos, just tell, like everybody kind of what they could picture in their heads. Yeah, the, the Sumatran rhino is, is pretty unique. And, uh, you know, most people, when they think rhinos, they definitely think of the rhinos in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but Asia has three different species of rhinos, and the Sumatran rhino is one, and it's, um, it's clearly the smallest of the rhino species. It's also known as the hairy rhino, and we certainly had hairy rhinos here at Cincinnati. Um, they tend to grow this longer hair, especially the calves are born all fuzzy, which to us just makes them cuter than ever. It's adorable. It's so <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they're descendants of the woolly rhinoceros, and so they, they're still carrying that gene that, that produces longer hair. Now over in Sumatra, they tend to lose that hair, um, and we find that really interesting, but we think it, it might be associated with all the mud wallowing and, and the mud pulling some of that hair off, or just the rubbing on the trees and things like that. But, um, but yeah, they're very different that way. Um, they are also incredibly charismatic and friendly towards people. Um, you know, in the wild, they're, they're elusive, they're solitary. It's very hard to, to see them. I mean, they, they try to stay away from people or any kind of disturbance as much as they can, but once they are um, in human care, they just adapt to people so quickly and so easily, and I think that is what makes people really fall for them, um, along with their somewhat prehistoric look and, and ancestry, which makes them really special. Paul probably has some more to add to that. Well, uh, their vocalizations are rather unique also. Uh, I know the other rhinos, the black rhino, and uh, have vocalizations, but you don't hear them a lot. Some do in, in human care, but uh, for the most part, the ones that I work with vocalize very little. But um, the Sumatran rhino has these squeaks and, and blows and whistles, and, and hearing them, uh, it's very unique. Uh, I, I believe it and I'm always fascinated by this, is that animals develop ways to communicate without having to come together because they can be kind of rough when they do come together. But, um, and this is conjecture on my part, but I'm sure it's, it's the ability to communicate without having to actually come together and potentially cause harm to one another. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're like just as you mentioned, really charismatic and like one of the coolest animals ever to to see and be near. Unfortunately, that is not something you can do these days. Um, I guess will you guys start with why they came to the U.S. and why they are no longer here in zoos, and just tell us kind of the story about you know you mentioned Ipu and Emmy and Rapunzel, um, how they ended up here and why people won't see them in zoos here anymore. Um, uh, the story that I heard, well, there was a consortium of zoos that they knew that the rhinos were fading fast in the wild, and they wanted to put a hedge against their extinction early on. This was in the 1980s, 
middle 1980s, late 1980s, and a group of zoo directors came together and they drew straws. You, Terry might be able to correct me, but I had heard that one Cincinnati Zoo employee drew the right straw and the first pair were to come here. Wow, okay. Um, so it's a chance of luck, basically? <laughs> to come here, yes. Is, is that true? I think you have more detail than I do. That's, that's <laughs> what, well, and so um, Mahatu came here first, laid over in California um, to acclimate, to get them out of the crate, to, to make sure they're healthy, and then she came here t to Cincinnati, and then Ipu did the same right after that. There was another animal or two that were destined for zoos in California, but then Ipu came here, and it's a long, long, long story, but uh, it ended up that Ipu stayed here, and then ultimately, because a lot of the animals didn't do well in human care, uh, Emmy came here to be with Ipu and tried their, their breeding here. Mm. So essentially, it was kind of like a last-ditch effort in hopes that there are plenty of animals that brought into zoos and human care when there's a, there are really low numbers in the wild. It is helpful, and we're able to repopulate them. So that was kind of the, the hope here. But it didn't necessarily work out that way, right? So we decided eventually Hairpan was born here, and I'd love to hear, like, the struggles about, you know, the breeding between Sumatran rhinos. And maybe you have more to say, add on to what Paul was saying, but... Um, the short, like, easier to understand version is we were hoping that we could help this population and are still hoping that we can. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, that decision in 1980s to bring some animals into managed care uh, was extremely controversial. In fact, Malaysia, Indonesia, the U.S., we were all involved in those conversations, not me personally, but those before us. And uh, Malaysia decided not to join the consortium and stayed out of it, and we mm. see what's happened today. Malaysia has no Sumatran rhinos. Yeah. Indonesia got, joined us in, in, in joined in this agreement, the Sumatran Rhino Trust Agreement between the United States and their country of Indonesia, and they agreed to send some rhinos to U.S. zoos with the hope of generating this backup population, kind of an insurance population uh, for the dwindling wild rhinos. It was a gamble. Mm -hmm. These kinds of things always are. Um, but Jenna, to your point, you don't want to wait too long because if you wait too long, there are too few animals and it, it's just doomed to fail. So they, they initiated this in the 1980s. Thank goodness they did. Um, we only received seven rhinos uh, from Indonesia to the United States. And these are seven rhinos that were captured in areas where there was um, the forest was being devastated. And so they were kind of you know, out of out of habitat anyway. Mm. Um, they were rescued animals, so to speak, of unknown fertility, unknown age, unknown health backgrounds. Uh, so starting a, a breeding program with just seven individuals with that kind of history is really an uphill climb. Yeah. Um, we had our work cut out for us. And Indonesia also kept some animals themselves and tried breeding them there. So we all struggled in the early years. We didn't know how to feed them properly, and we didn't know anything about their reproductive physiology. And so certainly there were some mistakes made. There was a steep learning curve, and um, it, just, it just took a while. And, and during that time, everybody involved was criticized harshly um, by the conservation community that this was not the way to go, that we had you know, done something that didn't make any sense, that wasn't to benefit the species. We persevered um, because, of course, we had the rhinos and we still had a chance to try and make something positive of it. Um, but, but there were a lot of naysayers out there. So by the time I really joined the Cincinnati Zoo in 1996, uh, uh, as Paul was saying, we were, we were down to um, Ipu and Emmy and one older female, Rapunzel. They were the only three animals left, three Sumatran rhinos left in the United States. Mm. And still, nobody had been able to breed. And we were kind of starting from square one. So we had to put a lot of science into trying to figure out the female's reproductive cycle, the female's fertility. Um, we learned fairly quickly that the older female Rapunzel was no longer fertile. She had a large tumor in her uterus and she also was not cycling or had basically no activity on her ovaries. 
but Emmy, our shining star, um, she was young and she was healthy and um, she was she was showing some reproductive activity and it just took us a long time to figure out um, exactly what was going on or with her reproductive physiology. So, and what did you find out? Yeah, to, to, to keep the story short, it, it happens that Sumatran rhinos are induced ovulators, um, which differentiates them from the other rhino species that will ovulate on a regular time schedule. So these Sumatran rhinos, you know, we, we like to look at the reproductive cycle and say, okay, it's been this many days since she ovulated, so she's going to ovulate on this date. But with an induced ovulator, they have to be exposed to a male in some way um, to trigger that ovulation. And while we were not introducing them regularly, she was not ovulating and we were not learning. <laughs> so, um, so it finally got to a point where, thank goodness, we had Paul and his team who were so good with these animals that we could take the risk of introducing them daily. Uh, and just seeing what the behavior was like for 30 minutes to an hour and not leave them together all day. And at that point, you didn't know they were induced ovulators. You were just like, well, they cannot make a baby if they are not together, so we're going to yeah. try. And then from that, those trials, you learned this. Yeah, we had, we had studied um, fairly intensively for about eight months, and I could not come up with, hey, this is the cycle length, and this is when she's going to be an estrus next. We needed to, go, to turn to something else. So we brought in the, the management side of things and really started looking at their behaviors and putting them together. And, um, and that went on for a number of days, probably over a month. And then all of a sudden, one day, um, uh, Ipu was in the pool resting, which is how we strategize it. So we only put her in when he's had his breakfast and, and is resting. And then we put her in. And that particular day, he just slowly emerged from that pool and started following her around and was very, very interested in her. And that was the first breeding attempt that we witnessed. And then, two days later, we finally saw that she had ovulated, and that's when the light bulb went off, and we realized, ah, she needed that male stimulus. That's why she had not been ovulating before. I have so many questions. So how does, is this partly why their numbers may be so low? Obviously, there's probably habitat, um, less habitat, habitat loss. I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. All these things happening in the wild. You mentioned, you know, like the forests were being cut down, that sort of thing, but if they if they're solitary animals and they have to come in contact with one another for them to ovulate to even have a chance of reproducing do you think that like is difficult like as far as why their numbers may not be as hard or like as high in the wild as you would like to see like it's harder for them to actually mate and have babies and well, it certainly is harder for them now because the roads that cut through the forests kind of keep them from crossing paths mm -hmm. and knowing, so the male can't find a female's, you know, smell and say, oh, in a day or two, she's going to be ready to breed. I need to follow this because there's all these, these disruptions to the forest. Okay. See, I guess that's, I didn't, I'm not using my words very well today, but like, so even though they're not ovulating, the males will smell something that tells them they will be in estrus. Like, I guess I don't get if they're not ovulating how the males know. Yeah, to because, because the hormone levels do start changing um, as the female is developing a follicle. So the male can pick up on that okay. and know to follow her, but it just won't ovulate uh, unless the male okay. stimulus is there. Okay, that yeah. makes, that, now yeah. I get it. Okay, I was like, I just don't understand if they just literally have to come across one another, but why would they? Why would, <laughs> yeah. if there's No, 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 yeah. there, there is some, some, yeah, there are some hormones that go out that, that okay. kind of signal, hey, she's ramping up. That makes more yeah. sense. And, and only from what is experience here <laughs> and maybe their assumptions, but again, you talk about being able to communicate. They spray urine, uh, male spray all the time and all over the place to communicate his presence, and a female will spray urine also, whether it's to mask uh, a calf that, that was just born or she's ready to breed, she's going to advertise too. Um, Another part that goes into the ovulation, I think, and this is only my opinion, is that, you know, for a lot of times we were not letting Sumatran rhino go through the full process because there's definitely a process, I think, of the female teasing and running away and the male will mount and then she'll take off or he wants... He wants her to run, and there has to be a lot of interaction. And for a while, I think that that 
interaction and that, um, for lack of a better term, aggressiveness, what was perceived as aggression, and then we split them up, I, th I think was reason that they weren't either becoming pregnant or staying pregnant or uh, ovulating or whatever. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Maybe it's still not fully understood, mm -hmm. but there's just an awful lot that goes into it. And to Dr. Roth's credit here, she was encouraging us to leave them together longer. And I remember it quite clearly because I was under the, the old rule of if they're not doing anything while well, leaving together or if they're being aggressive, you don't want anybody injured. But I clearly remember Dr. Roth saying, no, let's leave them together a little while longer. And that's mm -hmm. when things started to... That makes total sense. Yeah. Like, especially you have very few of these animals here in, or just these two, basically. Now in zoos, you don't want anything to happen to them. So you're extra yeah. cautious right. about everything that you do, which is, it's just a learning curve with these. And you guys figured it out, though, which mm -hmm. is incredible. And that's got to be so much pressure on you guys. Like, knowing that you have the only two Sumatran rhinos here in the United States, all eyes of the scientific community are kind of on you. What was that feeling like when you finally did see the courtship behavior and you finally did see the breeding? You had to just be overjoyed, right? Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, we were super excited, super excited. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I, think, I think I speak for both of us. Those days were stressful. Mm. Those mornings, it's like, okay, we're going to introduce them this morning. Everybody's on edge, right? Because you just don't know. And those animals are so, so valuable. Um, these guys were great though. And, and once we started getting into more of a routine, I think, I mean, Paul was really good in reading the behaviors too. And he would kind of be like, mm, Terry, nope, not, not this morning. We get, this is, this is way too much. Um, and I'd be like, yeah, leave them together. <laughs> so we were a good team that way. We went back and forth. Some give and take. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, but Paul would come out and start throwing bananas, and Ipu would stop, and we'd be able to give him a breather and start over again. And um, yeah, it, would, it 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 ran its course that way. But you're absolutely right. It's it's um, you know it's something when they we first got the breeding, we were really excited, and when we got that first pregnancy, super super excited. How um, many times did it take for the pregnancy? Not many. Oh, okay. I think it was the second breeding okay. that she actually conceived on. Um, but then we had the issue of pregnancy loss. Mm. Early embryo loss was a big problem, and um, we went through five of those, and that was hard because you're right. The conservation oh community, they were alerted that, hey, we have a pregnancy. This is huge Everyone news. gets excited, right? Everybody's excited, and then we had to be the bearers of bad news. Mm. And, oh, and, of course, what happens when that starts to be the case, people start pointing fingers. What are you doing? Mm. Why is she losing her pregnancy? Mm. You know, and then you start getting the blame. Um and, oh gosh, it's just human nature, but it's hard. And we had to kind of work through it and, and finally just tried something that happened to work, which was putting her on a hormone supplement um, that got her through that first pregnancy and, and the birth of Andalus. And all that learning experience, it's been really gratifying that we've been able to share it with Indonesia because, of course, we're not the only ones who have seen pregnancy loss in early pregnancy loss in a Sumatran rhino. They've experienced it over in Indonesia as well now. But we had this remedy that doesn't work 100% of the time, but at least we'd had some good success with it, and we quickly transferred it over to them, and they were able to apply it um, to their females too, and that has helped them carry pregnancies to term. Do you have any idea why they suffer with these issues or why they need the supplement? You know, in our case, Emmy only had the supplement her first pregnancy. Okay. And then after that, the other two calves she carried by herself completely naturally. Yeah. So you weren't, like, inclined to just give her the supplement for the second pregnancy just because? Or how did you it make was, that decision? It was a gamble. Okay. It was a gamble. What we do, what we kind of know, um, from a reproductive physiologist's perspective, um, and this is true for humans too, when you're trying to get pregnant your first time, if you've never had any, any offspring, it can be a challenge. The first one can be harder. And then it seems like once the body's gone through that pregnancy, sometimes the fertility's improved. And so we were basing it off that kind of logic. And I remember thinking, okay, we'll try this once, but if she, if we see an embryo and then she loses it the next time she's going right on that, okay. on that hormone. Um, but she carried it 
and so we we didn't put her on the hormone supplement and then she carried the third one her, by herself as well okay mm -hmm. yeah so her her first baby was obviously international news yeah. what year was this it was 2001 2001 okay <laughs> we're uh, testing your memories T right uh, now. <laughs> and this was on dollars yeah tell us about that like what was, was what did that feel like and is it 14 15 month gestation yeah, it's right around, four, four, usually around 475 days ish. <laughs> okay. Who's counting, right? <laughs> oh, we can't believe me, it's counted every we just, time. We just had a little bit of a surprise recently, but um, typically that's about how long it is. Um, well, the birth of Andalus was an interesting time because it was September 13th, 2001. Oh, wow. Mm. Just two days after 9 11. Yeah. I mean, it's something you would want to be celebrating, but also an incredibly crazy, yeah, terrifying time. Too. Yeah, yeah, it was a weird mix of emotions, and we did hear there was an outpouring from the community who thanked us for some positive news that week. You know, mm. in the midst of everything that was going on, um, but really, his his birth was pretty overshadowed with what else was happening in the country at the time. Yeah. That but makes sense. On just like your own personal levels, though, like Paul, do you remember? Was it overnight? Did you come in in the morning and find him? Did you expect oh, it? Could you see it happening uh, before he was born? Again, Terry Roth uh, was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? She knew a little bit early because I pulled up down at the canyon in my car to park. And I always went in to check on Emmy first, and Terry was just coming out of the building. And I said, hey, what's up? And she said, well, she, Emmy was doing some weird things, and she was up a lot, and just wondering. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, that was 7 o'clock in the morning, and she had it around, it was around noon. I want to say 11.30, but it might have been just a few minutes after noon. So, uh, Terry was ahead of the game on that one, and, <laughs> and uh, it was big news around here, that's that's for sure. So were you guys, was Keeper staff and the crew staff, were you guys like watching from the barn, or were you guys watching remotely from afar? Like, what Both, was your experience? Uh, I was at the building. Okay. Uh, I came in and I started my day, and people were gasping because I, uh, I went about my normal routine, and I hosed Emmy off, and I cleaned, and I did all my cleaning, and uh, put her back to her breakfast, and um, there were, everybody was a crew, and then I got done with my routine, I went up there and I checked in, but when she gave birth to Andalus, I was right there in the building, kind of hiding out, but watching her, and Dr. Campbell was right outside the building, and... Uh, saw it all the way through. And everything went well? No issues yeah. with the labor process? Yeah, everything everything went really, really well. So we tried to give her as much privacy as possible, so that's why we decided we, we needed Paul down there and we needed a vet really close close at hand. But all the rest of us were up at crew just walk, watching it remotely. Um, but it had been, to Paul's point, uh, some of us had been up all night uh, because the previous day, Emmy started acting a little funny late in the mm. afternoon and doing a lot of pacing and squirting urine all over the, and just seemed agitated. So we, we hung out and just watched her all night, um, but she did wait until the next day, about midday. <laughs> she kept make, you waiting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah she likes to, likes to put on a little bit of a, of a show before she gives birth. So. so this might sound stupid. To this point... There's obviously never been um, like this great documentation of a Sumatran rhino birth. Were you guys expecting the calf to be that hairy? Like, I, it would have come out, and I would have thought to myself, "Something's wrong with this baby." <laughs> like, <"Something's wrong." laughs> I don't know if it's so much the hair, but it's the eyes when those little ones are born. That first day, um, boy, their eyes are big, and their and their bodies are somewhat gaunt. They fill out mm. really, really fast. Um, but that yeah, that, their eyes like stick out. It, it yeah. seems like they're very like prominent yeah. on yeah. their heads in those it's early pictures I've seen. It's very interesting. Yeah, but um, but it really didn't matter what it looked like as long as it was healthy. Yes. Mm. Um, and we had done it, and so it was. Uh, that was truly an exciting, exciting time. Every one of them was. It it doesn't get old. That's for sure. So yeah. when were the next ones? How did it go from there? Well, then the next one was Suchi. 
Um, and she, you know, we, we were um, pretty much on the game about we need to breed back as quickly as possible. This is a critically endangered species. We need as many calves as possible. So um, we did separate the calves. Paul, Paul probably remembers better since he's the one in charge of that, that part of the puzzle um, when we decided to wean on Dallas from, from Emmy and start breeding her again. It was around a year, maybe a little bit longer. I have notes at home, and uh, it was about a year when we and Ernest started to really separate him. And it, this was a lot of learning, also, because he had been with Emmy his whole life. In the wild, surely they wander off a little bit and then come back. Maybe they can communicate again over over a slight distance, but um, we made the determination of a date to separate. If I recall correctly, I said, oh, I can't do it. I, I started to do it and they were crying. And <laughs> I, I don't I blame you. together for like another week or something yeah. or a day or something. I don't know. Uh, but then, yeah, we went ahead and made the break. And at this point, a year into it, the calf is nursing a lot. Emmy loses some condition. She was kind of glad to be away from yeah. it. You could tell she just kind of relaxed. And uh, even though Hairpin wasn't crazy, no, and Dallas wasn't crazy about it, uh, he, he adjusted to it fine. And he was eating. He did just fine. We didn't move him out of here until he was uh, about... 20 months, I think, or two years. Do you remember? Was it was that? something like that, something. yeah. And where did he go then? He went to Los Angeles. Okay. Um, but he was doing fine. He was eating. He was just fine. Los Angeles, it's, it's a complicated web of who gets what animals. But then again, he was a f the firstborn. He went to Los Angeles and... Uh, we went back to putting Emmy and Ipu back together. And did Suchi come without too many issues as well? Yeah, the Suchi, the Suchi was good. Um, yeah, Emmy had all her calves without any issues. Harapan was the interesting one because he came fast. Um, and he came hind legs first. Wow. Oh, that's nerve-wracking. <laughs> yeah, after you've seen the other two. It's... So we know now, I mean, rhinos do deliver that way, and it's not generally a problem. But when you first see it, it mm. kind of takes you by surprise because you, you kind of think head and four legs first. Um, but that didn't happen with him. Um, but she's, she, was, she was great in delivering and delivering. And it cows. didn't take her long to get pregnant between each one after. It, it didn't take too long after that. And like I said, once she was, once we saw that embryo, that second pregnancy, um, you know, or well, after the first pregnancy after she had Andalus, then we said, no supplement, let's see what happens. And um, it, it developed all the way to term and, and did just fine. And a very similar gestation length for all three of our calves. Yeah. They were very close together. Um, yeah. But, um, but Emmy did originally come from Los Angeles, and so that was the connection we had with. They sent her to us for breeding purposes, and so when mm. we had Andalus and we were looking for a place to put the calf because we were expecting again, um, got to make room for the gotta expanding family. <laughs> so we then moved him out to Los Angeles, so they had a Sumatran rhino again out there for some time. Can you guys tell us now, like, kind of the history of how decisions were made you know, we had these Sumatran rhinos born here. You guys figured it out. You, like, made this insanely important, successful, you know, discovery. And now you're able to help the rhinos in Sumatra and or in Indonesia in general. Like, how did we come to no longer having Sumatran rhinos here in the U.S.? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, huh? Um, you know, it, it's a very, very valid question. Um, typically if you, considering we were the first to breed them and we were the only ones to be breeding them for many years, it's not usually a wise decision to shut down your successful breeding program um, when you're trying to save an endangered species. But uh, the decision was kind of a political one coming out of Indonesia where they um, take great pride in the wildlife and the natural resources they have in their country including their rhinos, and they decided that they were not going to, especially since they were becoming so endangered, they were not going to send any more rhinos out of the country. Uh, and, and that message was very clear. And um, so we, 
you know, we realized that with just the few animals we had, and they were all closely related, um, we didn't have a lot of opportunity to uh, continue breeding for the long term. But um, initially, the first animal, Andalus, when he was shipped over to Sumatra from the Los Angeles Zoo, that decision was made primarily to help them with their breeding program. Because mm -hmm. at that point in time, uh, they were trying to breed, and they had one male of questionable fertility, and that's all they had to work with, and there was nothing else. And so by sending him over, we really jump-started their program, because here was this young, vibrant, healthy rhino um, that, fortunately, was very fertile. <laughs> um, and so, so that, was a, that was a huge start right there. Sending Harapan over was the harder decision uh, because that's when we were down to just one rhino and we knew we weren't going to get that female from Indonesia. And so, you know, it's, not, it's nice. There's great value in having animals as ambassadors and we could have just kept him here so people um, here in the West could see Sumatran rhinos and learn about them. But we decided, given their endangered status, that um, it was probably more valuable to give him the opportunity mm -hmm. to breed and to send him over to Indonesia just as we had his brother. Hmm. So speaking of Andalus and Harapan go back to Sumatra to hopefully breed is the goal one day. What's the what's been the word with that? Has Andalus had babies? What about Harapan? How are things going? Over can I there? interrupt you first? Yeah, yeah of that course. Question? Of course. Because we know we have the background, but <laughs> can you explain when you send these you send Andalus and Harapan to Indonesia? They aren't just here. You go. You find this forest and you and you release them there. Can you explain what? where they're living, how you keep track of them, how this is going, and then answer Mark's question. Yeah, I'm going to let I'm going to let Paul speak to that since he was a big part of transferring Harapan <clears throat> over to Sumatra. Uh, these animals live at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, um, which is in Wacombus National Park on the island of Sumatra. Um, it's managed care, but these animals are have their own paddocks of something like 25 acres of land or more. Um, big, wild, wild in, in quotation. Um, they're not around people all day. There's not people coming to gawk at them and to, and to see them in captivity. Uh, it's very private. Uh, they're managed, they're put together when they're supposed to. They develop, uh, they monitor them through ultrasound. Um, I'm not sure where else to go with that. My, my mind starts to wander, but um, they had the original, what I call a wagon wheel, is that all these, uh, these animals have a paddock then there's an empty space between one rhino and the next so that they're not like right up against each other. And uh, there's a place in the middle where they put animals together for breeding. And um, so now there's another wagon wheel adjacent and they can move animals back and forth because they have more animals now. And, um, that new facility is filling up fast also. So essentially these <clears throat> Sumatran rhinos that we're speaking about today are in a sanctuary and they have tons of space where they're able to forage on natural um, foods that they would find and because they're living where they're from and they are managed by people who are looking after them making sure that they you know, can't wander off in, into a busy road or something, but they also have a lot of space. And then they can be managed in the sense that they can put males and females together when they think it's best for them. So we work closely with uh, the Smutcher Rhino Sanctuary. So they're not in a zoo, but they're also not exactly wild rhinos. So essentially now we know what's going on with them. We know where Andalus is. We know where Harapan is. Or, um, they have keepers there that know them really, really well and take care of them, as well as other rhinos. So I just want to make sure people knew like how mm -hmm. this was happening, how we kept track of the rhinos and where they're, they're living now. Of course, there are wild Sumatran rhinos, but we do not know exact numbers, and they are not very high. Do you want to share the estimate you think 
Yeah, I mean, the estimate for the wild rhinos at this point is definitely below 100. Um, some of the forests there where we thought there were remnant populations in, we're having trouble finding them there now. So we think they may just pretty much all be bunched up in the north of Sumatra, where there definitely are some, uh, and there's evidence of them, and there's pictures of them. But the numbers are, are probably, you know, somewhere around 50 um, and not, not nearly as high as we had hoped. Mm. So, so that's a challenge, yeah. Um, but, right, these, these rhinos live in kind of an intermediate um, kind of situation yes. between wild and between managed. But the transition there, um, you know, you're asking how do they get from here and go all the way over there. There's a huge process to that. So obviously, there's a lot of regulatory issues, a lot of permissions, a lot of health testing that goes into that, setting up, you know, for an airline that's going to transport a rhino for us all that ways. Um, he had to travel by, by well, he got tr in a crate. He was, I think he was in a crate a total of 52 hours or something like that in that wow. transition. Yeah. Um, starting here where he was loaded and then up to um, the airport in Columbus where he flew out of there. You had multiple stops on your way to Jakarta. Jakarta onto another truck. From the truck we went to the ferry. From the ferry we crossed over onto Sumatra, back into a truck, and finally to the reserve at I don't know, three o'clock in the morning or something, wow. Indonesia time, um, when he was finally unloaded. The poor guy was a trooper. That yes. Was, that, was a, that was a haul. And once they're there, it's not over. Um, they try to protect them from all the insects initially. They cover the enclosure with netting. Mm -hmm. um, so they're in kind of a quarantine area for a while. They slowly um, subject them to the ticks and the leeches and things like that that they're going to be living with. Um, but making sure that they, they get small doses of them at the start so that they don't overwhelm them and, and monitoring them the whole time for their health. Um, both boys did really, really well because um, you do you worry about that when they are subjected to a new environment with new insects that there might be some viruses they're not accustomed to. That, right. I mean, we take yeah. medications when we exactly. travel to other countries for those purposes. Yeah. So, sorry, getting back to Mark's question, and can you tell us at the years that Andalus went and then Harapan went to Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary? Or around. It doesn't have to be the exact year, but like about how long ago? Uh, Andalus, I think, was he went from Los Angeles to Sumatra in 2007 or 9, 7, uh, and then Harapan left from here. Hairpin was a traveling rhino. Uh, he went from here, he was born in 2007, then he went to White Oak Plantation, who uh, they do an amazing job with white rhino, black rhino, they copy, mm -hmm. bongo, ev every, everything. They do a huge conservation work. Okapi, they manage, that's a whole other to uh, topic. <laughs> Uh, so, from Cincinnati to White Oak, White Oak to, they drove him to Los Angeles in a truck. I wasn't part of that. From Los Angeles, he came back here to Cincinnati, which I was part of. And then from Cincinnati to uh, Sumatra, SRS. Um, so, he traveled a lot. He did great every time. He, he really enjoyed people's company. It's all he really knew other than his mother. Uh, so when he was here, he definitely knew when you came into the building. He knew when it was breakfast time, knew when he was supposed to go out. He was he, very charis charismatic. I know that's being used too much, but he was very personable. I, he understood people, and I think we understood him a little bit. But uh, so he went over there and they were slow. There's a whole big uh, thing on the internet about his travels and um, what all went into that and him acclimating there. But, and then I saw him, uh, I saw him in two, uh, 2000, I, when Rosa had her baby, which was 21. 2022. 2022 in March. And uh, and he had been there since 2015. 15, he moved. Yeah. He moved in in the fall of 2015. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. He he was just a. To me, I I compared him to a teenage boy who who kind of 
was throwing his weight around, but he still, people ask this all the time, do animals recognize you? And for this long, I can say yes. When I was there to drop him off and then went back for Delilah's birth, uh, and I called to him, and he turned, and he, he finally did come up, and it was kind of like he recognized me. And I usually don't like to say that because it's anthropomorphism, uh, and you don't know, but this was clear. We, I was so glad to see him, and he recognized my voice. And other animals that I work with, the, uh, the red pandas and other things, they most definitely recognize people, and that was a good, big part of some gratification that uh, I knew he was happy, but he still, he still remembered me. And I know that sounds terrible. And, no, I no. feel like he's he is just an incredible animal, and I didn't get to yeah. work with him, but I did get to meet him. You let me meet him and like go in with him and share space with him, which was incredible way back when before he left. And then, so I met him once, like. I went in 2019, I had the most magical opportunity in the world to visit um, SRS, and again, I like don't like to say this, but he, the his keepers there were shocked because he like gravitated towards me and sat down right next to me and like, it seemed, we weren't supposed to touch them and I probably shouldn't say this, but it was just so obvious that he wanted like someone to touch him <laughs> and he sat down right next to me, there's a whole group of people. And I'm not a rule breaker, but I broke the rules, and I just, like, stuck two fingers in and touched his foot, and nobody said anything, so I just kind of sat there. He made me cry. Like, they were all saying how, like, do you smell like Cincinnati? Did you work with him? Does he know you somehow? I'm like, no, I don't think it, he does. But I think he's just, like, too. a really special, special rhino, and that is just, like... I didn't want to make it about me, but I wanted to share that story, one, because it means so much to me. But, like, I don't know, I just think it shows how special Harapan is, so... Um, I think he absolutely recognized you, knows you, and you could go back 10 years from now and, he, and without seeing him between then and now, and he would, he would come up to you. But um, definitely, I, I, mean, I think it's so cool that you've gotten to go back and, and check in on them. Yeah, those relationships, that's the best part of our job, definitely. right, is being able yeah. to build and foster those relationships with your animals. So it's got to be incredibly gratifying when you get to see the fruits of your labor you know, years after the animal has gone and to a new place. That must have been like the hardest move ever, like between the decisions yeah. and just the length of it and all the things and saying goodbye. Like, yeah. I can't imagine how, how difficult and emotional that was because it's also like hopeful, like maybe he'll he'll save his, his species by coming to Indonesia now and that sort of thing. So that kind of goes back to what Mark was asking earlier. Yeah. Do we have any updates? How, how's Harapan doing? How's... Uh, Andalus doing? Have they had babies there? What's what's the update? Oh, absolutely. So Andalus um, has been doing a great job since he went over there. He has sired three calves at this point, um, which is really it's really outstanding. Um, it it takes a little while for the staff to get used to managing these new boys when they get over there. So it always there's a few years where you're just kind of crossing your fingers and giving them whatever tips you can. Um, and with Harapan, it took a little bit longer. Um, but we are just, yeah, the, the birth of the most recent calf here in November was Harapan's first offspring, a little baby boy, hey. which um, just, you know, puts a, puts a happy twist to the story. Mm -hmm. You know, just having that happy ending just means the world to us. And you just don't know that that's going to happen when you send a rhino off like that. There are so many other things that could happen. Um, but the team at the SRS, you know, we've been working with them for so many years now, and they're just doing a fantastic job. They have certainly learned the trade, and they know how to manage those rhinos, and I think both Paul and I have great confidence in their abilities, uh, which, is, which is a really good place to be. It's really nice. It's, you know, it's, it's one thing to figure it out in Cincinnati and to have some success, but if we can't pass that on to others, it kind of, kind of lives a short life. Right. But, now it's got some longevity. We've got a whole team in Indonesia um, that is that is able to breed the species just as we did here, using kind of the same information and the same tools, and um, and it's great. And so uh, I kind of feel like we're the we're now the, more the spectators, but we're enjoying <laughs> it nonetheless. Um, because how can you not, right? <laughs> yeah. So like you said, it's still you're able to kind of see the fruits of your labor because this is all information that you guys were able to pass along. And Dr. Roth and Paul, you guys have both been there multiple times, right, over the years to help out, to kind of give some advice and some tips, right? 
Yes, yeah. yes. We've been we've been traveling back o over there for many many years. I think my first trip over was in 1998, and then I was going almost yearly. Um, you know, sometimes it was both Malaysia and Indonesia. Sometimes it was just Indonesia, and then of course since Malaysia doesn't have Sumatran rhinos anymore, it's it's been just primarily Indonesia the last decade or so. Uh, and Paul has gotten to go over for many of their births. So not um, just gone over. You're there for the births. Mm -hmm. That yeah. has to be magical. Yeah. Uh, three births, and I was supposed to be there, there for this birth. Had my ticket purchased and everything. I was going to leave on December second, be there before the fifth, which was her. Oh, her, I was like, uh, why didn't you go? Date her ex earliest expected date. Wow! But then. She went about 10 days earlier on a Saturday, the, I can't remember now. After Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving. So November 25th, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Saturday, that's and, right. Uh, she went early, but the cool thing is about it that she had it out in her paddock where they would normally bring her into a birthing boma, so she would be on film or on closed circuit TV and constantly kept tabs on, she had it out in her paddock, and so when the keepers went out there early morning, went out to bring her up, there's it, a baby. Was, <laughs> it was a baby laying there next to her, and uh, there's so much that I would go out on tangents just about that, to knowing how she behaved out there, that's, yeah. that's the thing that I'm most interested in, is did did she walk around and calling and squeaking and spraying and making this whole big production out of it, or did she go about it calmly and quietly and have a baby? But when they got there, it was laying comfortably, still a little wet, I think, but got up and started nursing right away out there. And um, it's hard to believe because when they're that young, when they're newborn, they look kind of frail, but uh, it doesn't take them long to be able to follow mother. And I'm sure she stays right around where she's comfortable. But um, had a newborn baby out there, and all was really well, really well. Did you mention which female this gave birth most recently? Delilah. Delilah. Okay, Delilah. she was my Born in 2015. And I saw her born. Over that's, there. That's such a cool so, full circle. Uh, human care animals that are um, that are now reproducing almost in the wild, or at least uh, as close as it gets, but still safe. Gets, yeah. Do yeah. you? So there was also a calf that just just turned a little over a year, or is a year now. Recent? Rosa's calf? Rosa's calf, and yeah. that was on Dallas and Rosa, right? Yeah. No, that was no. on Datu. <laughs> on Datu, yes. Fill us in. Can you guys tell us about all the rhinos? It was, it was <laughs> on Dallas's yeah. son okay. who sired a calf with Rosa. Okay. Rosa's first, okay. and Datu's first in 2022. So we have all these firsts. And now, now it's Delilah's first and Harapan's first okay. together. So it's really great. So we've got these calves that were, were born at the SRS that are now reproducing themselves, um, which is just like our calves have gone over there and are, are now siring. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. And the, and the story between Delilah and Harapens even talk about a magical moment. Um, those two, it was the first time she had mated with a male. It was the first time he had mated with a female. She conceived. Wow. And wow. there we are. We have yeah. a cat. It's a match made in heaven right it there. Was really. It was absolutely meant to be. <laughs> because the hairpin had been there for a while. Did it just not work out for him to be with a female or in the past years? And this was the first time that it made sense? or Yeah, no, they were trying with other females. Um, but they did have some behavioral challenges okay. with him. Um, and you never really know, you know, like Paul said earlier, the behavior of these rhinos, it's hard to read. Um, and how much of that pre courtship aggression do you put up with right and and, mm. and i think we're a little more tolerant of it here than they are over there um so it if there was a, a little bit of aggression they're more likely to separate them um but they, they but they, they had some challenges with with the behaviors of them for for whatever reason so he had some opportunities prior to delilah 
Um, but they just said that it just seemed like him and Delilah were a good match. And Perfect. I don't really know what they based that on. Yeah. Like, all I can do is <laughs> listen to what they're saying. Right. Um, but I know when I was there, uh, it, it, I was there in um, 2022, and they had mentioned that they had put them together, and there was good interaction but no breeding. And then about three weeks after I'd left, that's when the actual breeding took uh, place. Awesome. So they were very optimistic when yeah. they talked to me that, that visit. And I could tell they had a real good feeling about them, but I, I can't pinpoint why. Because I, of course, wasn't there when they did the introduction and didn't see it myself. But I could tell they felt really good about it. And so then, sh sure enough, shortly thereafter, it was successful. So how many rhinos do we have in managed care at the SRS right now? Yeah, you know, the, the exciting thing about that question is that it actually takes a minute to count them in my head <laughs> at this point in time, which is a very, very good problem to have. But they have, they're up to 10 rhinos at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, just a couple years ago, they built a second ring, uh, as, as Paul had described earlier. The darn thing's filling up. So... So we need more space for these rhinos to hopefully grow their population and get it to a more stable or, you know, yeah. healthy size. Do they have the space for that? Do they have the capacity? Are there any issues that will stop them from doing that? They have, you know, they're, they're part of the, they're built right in the national park. And the national park has been very supportive, a very good partner in this effort. And so they can expand um, and they are right now they are already making plans for a third ring that they really feel is going to be important for a couple reasons one they've got a lot of calves right now which is fantastic and that's going to keep going but we're also hoping to capture a few rhinos up in the north and we really need those for the genetic diversity mm. you know you realize all of those calves at the Sumatran rhino sanctuary are related to the Cincinnati line right we need some new genes and everybody's aware of that and um, the government has promised to capture a few more rhinos and so those rhinos should also go to the SRS and get mixed in okay. so that we can get that diversity um, up with the gene pool so um, yeah so a third ring is definitely on the horizon and a big need for the SRS to keep this the momentum of the program so mm -hmm. is this something that they need funds for or do they have the funding already is there anything that we could do I don't know by sharing this podcast you know helping the you know SRS out to help this happen yeah you know one of the big supporters of the SRS is the International Rhino Foundation uh, so they certainly have it on their radar. It's one of their big fundraising projects going into 2024, one of their, basically one of their capital campaign projects. The estimate is that the entire ring is going to cost about $2.5 million to build. Okay. Um, money goes a long ways in Indonesia. So, um, so we're hoping that that money can be raised fairly quickly, uh, but we don't currently have a particular donor or donor, donor source okay. in, in mind. So. Anybody who wants to contribute um, to, you know, the, the pool of funds we're going to need to build that ring, that would be fantastic. I mean, we don't normally ask for people to donate money on this podcast, but this is one of those times where I feel like if you feel like giving, for whatever reason, um, International Rhino Foundation, you can check out their website. They do, like Dr. Roth mentioned, incredible work, and they work mm -hmm. really closely with SRS and... Um, you know, maybe we can all collectively help make this happen sooner because this, I feel hopeful now. Like, yeah, you know, you yeah. hear these really low numbers, but he, having two calves in the last two years or year and a half or so is a huge, like, forward step, right? Or, I mean, at least it seems like it to me. I don't really know as much, like... Oh, you know, in my mind, 2023 will be the year of the Sumatran Rhino just because we had two calves born in one year. And such a huge, huge step forward. Yeah. Um, and even a third, and if you go back to 2022, uh, that means three in about a year and a half. Fabulous. You know, when you're talking about fewer than 50 rhinos, uh, each individual is so, so yeah, Sadly, three is a huge number yeah. if you're looking yeah. at that population yeah. size. And one thing we've learned in zoos is when you stop breeding animals for a while because you run out of space, it's really hard to start again. Oh, right, mm -hmm. yes. So let's not make that mistake over there. Yeah. Yes. Let's just keep them breeding. And that's one of the reasons we're so uh, passionate about Bowling for Rhinos here is because they like that money does go to IRF and, and essentially SRS. So, um, you know, if you even if you just want to support by coming to our Bowling for Rhinos event next year, it's usually in September, or October. We always highly recommend that. And that's what gave me the opportunity yeah. to go over there and experience it and why I'm so passionate about all of this. But, um, yeah, Sumatra Rhinos are such special animals and... Um, Thank you guys for all of your incredible work. Like yeah. the the things you've helped 
the world learn about Sumatran rhinos is incredibly important and just amazing to me. Um, and I know we have trivia, and I was wondering if there's anything else you guys thought we should mention before um, moving on to trivia, or just any explanations or fun stories you want to share about any of the rhinos you've worked with? Did we miss anything? Emmy and Ipu were such fantastic animals and leaders, and uh, Emmy, when, when we were, if we go back and we're talking about putting them together and uh, there was some times you had to separate. The thing I remember is Emmy would run through that bottom gate and I didn't have to worry about her at all because I knew she would go through and then turn around and and then we would manage that bottom gate to try to get Ipu to slow down, throw bananas to him, <laughs> and then open it up again when he was he had been able to gather his his thoughts and maybe be a little <laughs> bit more a little bit nicer. I know that's human talk, but uh, those two animals, I used to say, they had the weight of the world on them, mm -hmm. and then they really did, and they uh, they did what they had to do here. And Emmy was such a great mother, and Ipu was such a character. He was he was half wild, but also. A really great rhino to know and I get a little bit uh, emotional about it but those two animals really it goes down to them making those calves and I don't know that's I just wanted to get those two in there and and make sure people knew that those animals really were the catalyst for everything now yeah so our original two Emmy and Ipu Andatu's newest calf is their great grandchild, correct? Yep, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good to be Andatu. Right? Andatu. 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 Andatu is good with the family. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Just, for our local our local listeners, um, Ipu was actually displayed at the Cincinnati Museum Center. So if people mm -hmm. want to see a, a Sumatran Rhino, it's not the same as seeing them live. Um, Paul and I will say that much. I'm sure Jenna, you would agree, but mm. at least it's something. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, well, I've got some trivia if you guys are up for it, if you'll humor me. Some uh, general rhino trivia here for the three of you today, if you're up for it. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. We haven't done trivia in a if while. If you can suffer through our <laughs> responses. So this is it, not necessarily Sumatran rhino related. This is just rhino related trivia. This first one was um, spurred by a discussion at my family Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. So, That's really interesting. <laughs> be curious to hear your responses on this one. How fast can a rhino run? I'm going to say it's, it's, over, it's like 30 miles per hour. I was going to say like 27. 27 oh, you're being precise. You have a guess. 35. 35, yeah. 35. Everything I found is about 35 okay. miles per hour. So that's really fast. Yeah. My, I have some family members who are convinced they can outrun a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling them, I tried telling them, I'm like, trust me, you're not outrunning a rhino. They wouldn't believe me they could run 30, 35 miles That's an hour. That's really like, fast. Hippos are like 18, 19, yeah. and most humans can't run that fast. So tell your family they're yeah. not even close to a I tried telling them, but, you know, you see these rhinos, they're big animals. Yeah. I'm not, maybe not the Sumatran rhinos, they're a little smaller, but... The black rhinos and the white rhinos, they're massive, and they can still get up to 30, 35 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah. Tell, tell your family not to try it. Yeah, yeah don't, don't try it. <laughs> don't try That's it. good advice. Don't test it. <laughs> All right, we talked about somehow our rhinos are so unique. What is the rhino's closest living relative? There's a couple species I'll accept as correct answers. I, Do you have I any know guesses? It. I know. What is go it? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, horses and tapers. Horses and tapers, we got it right on Random the money. Man yeah. knows it. Horses and taper, their closest living relatives, which I would not have guessed. I'm, I guess tapers kind of, they have some similarities between taper and rhinos, but I would have never guessed no, horses. No, I wouldn't have guessed yeah. horses either. Parasodactylus. <laughs> yep, that. Yep. yep. And what is the that. odd toed <laughs> ungulates, right? Odd, it's the yeah. parasodactylus <laughs> versus the ardeodactylus where there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Alrighty, that's if we're getting scientific. Dr. Ross always <laughs> yes. here to educate us. She's always here. She's got her back. She's making sure we learn a little bit. All right, last question I have for you. We talked about how endangered Sumatran rhinos are and all rhino species in general. Our second last question, 
What is the only rhino species that is not currently listed as endangered by the IUCN? The white rhino. White rhino. We got it. You guys are on fire today. We're three for three. The white rhino is the only one that's not considered endangered. Uh, they are listed as near threatened currently, uh, but even their numbers are in decline. So I honestly, it's probably only a matter of time until they're considered endangered. And Right. There's a huge uptick in poaching in Africa, and mm. uh, you could talk for an hour just about that, but the northern white rhino is all but extinct. Mm. I think there's two females left they're trying to work with to regenerate that animal. And if you go back in history, the white rhino was nearly extinct in the 20s or 30s, mm -hmm. I think. And they brought those animals back to where they're the, the highest number of rhinos now. It can be done, but humans are uh, notorious for wiping animals out, and we're right in the middle of it now. Yeah, they again, can. Again. It's a story of hope, though, for the southern white rhino, at least. Kind of, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, the Sumatran rhinos will follow their lead and recover to a, a sustainable population. But. Last question I have for you guys, Jenna. You know we've always got at least one crazy question, so <laughs> we'll see where you guys land with this one. Um, artist by the I'm probably going to mispronounce this. An artist by the name of Albrecht Dürer is famous for creating the most famous rhinoceros artwork. He created this piece of work in 1515. It's it's a woodcut piece of art just called the rhinoceros. Where is Albrecht Dürer from? You guys have probably seen this piece uh, yeah, of art, I'm actually. I'm sure we yeah. have. Paul seems familiar with it. I think, I know, I, think it. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a, it's Where a is print from? now. It's, it's a print. It's a print now. It's a print. Yeah. Yeah. We love it. Oh, I love it, too. Yeah. Um, where is he from? Yeah, where is he from? He made this piece of art in 1515. Germany or Vienna or somewhere like that. Germany, you guys are on fire. Guess. Guys, oh my Germany. gosh, but that was just like a total guess. You guys are four for four today. <laughs> He's from Germany. I'm sure if I showed you guys an image of this, you've seen this picture before, which is striking to me because when I did some research about it, I always thought to myself, that rhinoceros kind of looks like a mutant. Like it looks a little uh, bit odd. There's something a little bit off with it. Albrecht Dürer never actually saw a rhino. Really? He made this image, this piece of art, just off of a written description. Of wow, rhinos. Yeah, that's he, interesting. He never yeah, saw and it actually one turned person. out to look somewhat like a rhino. Yeah. It's impressive to me. It, it's in, it kind of looks like an armadillo-y it's rhino. Got huge plates. Huge right? plates. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. Love, we love that sketch. Yeah, yeah. huge it's plates. Huh. Probably an Indian rhino that they described, but um, yeah. Except it probably has two horns. Or, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't I'll remember check right it out. Now, it just has one. Does it? <laughs> okay. It's got the plates and everything. And yeah. it, it looks like a tank. I wouldn't have said an armadillo. I would say a tank. Mm -hmm. uh, props to you guys. Four for four today. I'm impressed. Should have known. We have Dr. Roth on. Of course we're going to go four for four today. It was Paul here. He's the rhino trivia expert. Paul's apparently the rhino artwork expert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knew? But Jenna, do you have anything else for our guests while we have them today? Well, again, thank you guys. I, I don't mean just for being on the podcast, but I think it... It means so much to me that we have people like you that are saving species in yes. this world and seriously making huge, overcoming huge things. But in figuring things out, I can't even speak, so I don't know how to figure <laughs> out rhino reproduction. But if there's something else that you do or what can others do to be helpful in this world, what can I do? There's a, you know, there's a lot you're already doing. Um, there's a lot that everybody's doing, but there can always be more. Um, something that I've been trying to do at home is to kind of convert more and more to um, electric tools instead of things that put out emissions that are bad for the air and add pollutants to the environment. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, the drills you have at home, the weed whackers you have at home, those things can all be battery operated now. Mm. And, um, and they're, they're good quality products. And so it's, it's a nice way to kind of transition away from those two cycle engines that we know are not only really noisy, but, um, but do put out the emissions that we don't need in our air. I love that. It's something I have never thought of. Like uh, we have, I guess, battery operated leaf blowers here that we use in our department and weed whackers, and weed yeah. whackers yeah. but 
Um, you know, apparently there are things like, um, what were you mentioning before? Um, uh, yeah, there's even small uh, chainsaws, chainsaws yes. that you can get that are battery operated. So the batteries are getting better. So even some of these more powerful instruments are becoming battery operated and it's kind of a, it's kind of neat. It also gives you a lot of freedom. You don't have that cord right. plugged yeah. into something or you don't have to start Go. an engine, a yes. two cycle engine. Some of us hate doing that. Go buy more gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So think about it at home. Sometimes it might just be a small appliance you can, you can switch out. Yeah. Easy yeah. thing to do and a reason to go shopping, I guess, if you need that. For <laughs> <laughs> Even though we don't recommend buying things you don't need, but <laughs> <laughs> I no, I love that one. And like you mentioned, like I think the I think a lot of people's trepidation back in the day when these things first came around was like, oh, they're not as powerful, they're not as effective as the gas powered ones, but now they're just as good in most cases. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, they've just really come a long way. Yeah. So um, I think it's the, I think it's a trend. Yeah, Definitely. I like it. I like. Well, as Jenna said. Thank you guys so much, not only for joining us for the podcast today, but all the work you've done with Sumatran and Rhinos and Rhinos in general over the years. You guys have some of the most special experiences with Sumatran and Rhinos of probably oh anyone in yes, the entire in the globe, world. honestly, yes. which is crazy to think. But thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to do so. Thank you, and thanks for spreading the word. You guys yes. do a great job with of this course. podcast. Thank um, you. We appreciate yeah. that. Try our best out there. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Thanks for coming, Paul. Thanks for coming. If anyone out there at SRS happens to be listening to this, keep up the good work yes. out there. We're happy to have Pan's baby on the ground, happy and healthy. So until next time, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Have a good one.